Restoration Church, welcome to another edition of Jesus Without the And. Uh, I don't have a, a story again for us this week because, you want to know why? Because I have so much to go through uh, today that I know that if I stop and give you a five-minute story, we're going to be behind before we even begin. And so here's what I want to do for the introduction. Here's what I want to say. Number one, uh, we've been in this series for a while now. We've got five weeks left. Paul has defended himself. Paul is the writer. I'm not talking about some dude named Paul. Paul has defended himself as an apostle in the first two chapters of Galatians. Uh, in, in the next two chapters, in chapters three and four, he's defended the gospel and what it means. And now in, in chapters five and six, you guys, we are going to get his application to resist legalism. And it's going to get heavy. It's going to go fast for these next five weeks. There's a lot to get into. And, uh, and so we're going to jump right in. In. Are you guys ready? I know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something completely different and not giving you any sort of warm-up, anything just like, hey, here's a fun story. None of that. We're just diving right in because we have so much to talk about today. So we are going to be in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be starting in uh, verse 1. As you turn to uh, that, if you are not driving somewhere, welcome. Thank you for checking out Restoration Church Online. So happy you're here. If you want to come visit us at the brewery sometime, we meet at Right Brain Brewery uh, on Sunday mornings at 9.30, and we do this. Uh, we do uh, a message, and we uh, sing some songs, and we gather together, and we do a lot of cool stuff. So we encourage you to come there. All right. You ready? Galatians 5, verse 1. Now, right before this, I always do that, don't I? Uh, right before this, Paul had told the Galatians in the letter that you are no longer children of the slave woman, but you are children of the free woman. And I need to say that because verse 1 starts out, for freedom, Christ has set us free. It, some, some translations even say, therefore, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, I want to just stop. I know it's one phrase. Like I said, we got a lot to get into here. Therefore, Christ has set us free. No one else has set us free. You guys, we need to get that through our thick skulls that for freedom, Christ has set us free. Who? What? Christ has set us free. Anytime I try to set myself free, it's like one of those Chinese handcuffs things where the more you try to get out, the worse it becomes. Uh, any of those like like torture devices, I guess, maybe could be like that too. I've no, no, never tried it. Um, but you get, you, or, or, or quicksand, right? You you start, I used to be so afraid of quicksand growing up. I thought for sure that was gonna, I was gonna run into it somewhere and I was gonna sink. Um, but the, from what I understand in movies and stuff is, is quicksand is a thing where you start, uh, it, the, the more you move, the more you try to get out, the harder it is the, and the quicker you sink. So we need to understand that it's for freedom. Christ has set us free. Not my good deeds, not the things that I'm uh, capable of doing, not my good behavior, not my how many times I pray, not how many times I have church attendance. The only way that I've been set free is because of Jesus Christ. And it's for freedom that he has set us free. He didn't set us free to then like to transfer us to another prison, right? Like we didn't get on the prison bus and go from one prison to the next one because we're getting transferred. No, we, we got, we got out. Like Christ opened up the jail and all of us were able to walk out of ourselves because of what he did. And it's, again, it's what he did. We didn't get early release. We didn't get early release on, on good behavior or parole or any of those things. The, 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 the cell gates opened up and we got to walk through it. We are free in Christ Jesus. You guys, I've been speaking to, to seven to 13 year olds for the entire week. And I'm so glad I now get to speak to adults again because uh, I, I just, I, I miss you guys. All right. And so um, we are going to get after this. Uh, and that's just one phrase. All right. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Stand firm. Don't fall back and put yourself back in the prison cell. Jesus has opened up the prison cells. We've walked out. We're free. We don't need to go back again into a prison cell. And he's telling the Galatians, you don't have to go into slavery in order to have a right relationship with God. Jesus has set us free. It's for freedom. Christ has set us free. So therefore, stand firm and don't and do not submit again to a yoke of 
slavery. It blows my mind that 50% of people actually wind up back in prison uh, who get released from prison. It's a mind-numbing statistic, and, and, and for the Christian, I don't, I, I don't even know what the statistic is of people who get set free by Jesus and then decide that we need to live um, according to some sort of law or some sort of rule. I, I, I can only, I mean, the early church, okay, the early church was set free. Jesus set the free, and they understood it. In, in their minds, the way that they lived, everything that they did was because they were free in Christ Jesus. They were no longer slaves. They were, and they understood it probably more than most. And what's happened over time, I mean, they didn't even have the Bible. They didn't even have text to go on and they completely changed the world because of their freedom. And I think what slowly has happened over the last couple thousand years is, is we've gotten the Bible, which has been an amazing blessing for us. We get to see what Jesus said, and, and, and it's always right in front of us. It's in almost every single language. It's beautiful. But what's happened is, is we've gotten lazy, and, and we've submitted again to yokes of slavery. Uh, for instance, and, and I know I bring this one up, often, but I, it, it's, it's the clearest example that I have and the one closest to me is uh, the issue of alcohol. Now, the Bible's very clear about what the issue in alcohol is. It says, don't get drunk with wine. Okay, then I'll get drunk with uh, bourbon. No, 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 no. Don't get drunk is what the Bible says. Now, if that's an issue for you, then you should stay away from alcohol altogether. Just stay away from it. I've got a few friends that are ha, have been alcoholics and they're like, no, I I cannot have alcohol. I'm refraining from it. If, if you feel like alcohol is going to kill you, then you should probably stay away from it. But for everybody else who can have a good relationship with it, that's, it's not going to become an addiction. It's not going to become their God. Then they can drink whenever they, they feel like they want to. I mean, as long as it's, again, not to get drunk with wine, not to get drunk. But what's happened is, is probably at one point, somebody had an issue with alcohol in the church and they just decided uh, that, and, and there's scripture that they could back it up, that uh, the, uh, to, to not be, um, uh, well, to not be drunk and um, about people drinking. I'm losing my mind right now. Uh, and, and so they, they would start to say, you know what, then, then we're just not going to drink. And, and, and that no one should drink because all it does is bring it, um, it, it's just foolish for people to do so. And so uh, one person probably decided it and then it just started catching steam more and more and more. And now all of a sudden it's an entire thing that if you're a Christian, you don't drink alcohol because one person had an issue with it at one point long time ago. And then it got passed down, passed down from, from generation to generation and then it became an entire thing and now like we grow up in the Baptist church and we don't even think that Jesus drank wine we call it grape juice so we're submitting to a yoke of slavery when there doesn't need to be one there stand firm and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery and again I can't stress this enough if you have an issue with drinking don't drink all right? Because the yoke of slavery is going to be alcohol at that point for you. Do you see what I mean? Like if you start drinking and it's an issue for you, you're going to continue drinking and now you're going to be enslaved to that. And if you're going to be enslaved to it, then you're not doing verse one. We should probably go to verse two because I am way behind already. <laughs> okay, here we go. Look, I, Paul, say to you, that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Now, this is not talking about the physical act of, uh, it is talking about the physical act of, of circumcision, but it was more about the theology behind it, that the Judaizers were coming in saying, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be circumcised because Abraham was circumcised and all of the Israelites have been circumcised. And so uh, it was the covenant thing. So it's not about the actual act of circumcision, but what the meaning was behind it. Paul is going to later on say, if you want to get circumcised, go for it. Like, but be, be circumcised, uncircumcised, that doesn't matter, okay? And that's what he's saying here. If you accept circumcision as a way to gain favor with God, Christ will be of no advantage to you. 
Basically, he's saying it's law supplanting, supplanting grace. Moses supplanting Christ. Anytime we add to Christ, anytime we say Jesus, I don't have it up there. Anytime we say Jesus and, anytime we say Jesus and, we are taking away from Christ. We don't add to Christ. Anytime we add to Christ, it's taking away from Christ. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Christ supplemented is Christ supplanted. You can write that down if you want to. I'll say it again. Christ supplemented is Christ supplanted. If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no value to you. If you do any sort of good work whatsoever, and you think that that's going to gain you favor with God, that you are going to be more loved by God, that your salvation is more secure by all of the good things that you do, your church attendance, all, all the list that we made last week of, of uh, what it means to be, if you might be a legalist, if dot, dot, dot. Anything that we do to try to make ourselves look better for God, to make ourselves uh, help out along the way, anything we do is going to be of, then that means that Christ is no value to us. Verse three, let me fix that. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Not just the easy ones. Paul is reminding them, hey, you want to accept circumcision? You want to be, you want to, you want to follow that? Anyone who accepts circumcision is now obligated to keep the whole law, all of it, 613 of them. And he's saying, good luck. You want to accept that one? You're going to have to go the whole way. It's like if I get pulled over for speeding, I can't tell the cop, well, I'm a really good dad. It doesn't matter. I broke a law. <laughs> and so he's going to be like, cool, I'm glad you're a great dad. Become a better driver, right? Like he, he, he's not going to care how good of a dad I am, that I'm a pastor or whatever it is. In that moment, I've broken the law. And I need to. It doesn't matter how well I keep every single other law. If I break that one law, I'm what? I'm guilty. And that's what Paul is saying. You want to follow that? You want to go in that direction? You want to accept circumcision? Then you are going to have to follow the whole law. You are obligated to the entire thing. Verse 4, you are severed from Christ. That's a little play on words there. You who would be justified by the law have fallen away from grace. Circumcision, what he's telling the Galatians, circumcision means excision from Jesus. See, he's saying, you guys want to go under the knife? There's two things that are going to be cut, and both are going to hurt. You're going to be cut off from Christ, and you know the other thing. You are severed from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. We think of sinning as falling away from grace, and I don't understand why we think of sinning as falling away from grace. In a sense, when we sin, we're actually falling into grace. So he's not talking about, uh, uh, about sin here. He, he's talking about people who want to follow the law. If you're going to follow the law, you're going to be falling away from grace. You're falling into law and away from grace. Remember, grace and law is like oil and water. They don't mix. And he's saying, you've fallen away from grace. When we sin, we just need to keep falling into grace. Fall into grace. Realize that we bring absolutely nothing to the table. Jesus completed all of it. He finished the job. When he said, it is finished, tetelestai from the cross, he meant it is finished. It wasn't like, uh, tetelestai sort of, uh, there's a few things you guys are going to have to do in order to make this really work. Uh, I'm going to have to have you guys do a few things. I, my sacrifice was okay, but I need you to do a little bit more if you don't mind. No, we fall into grace, realizing that there's nothing we can do. And we live under that banner of tetelestai that it is finished. Now that doesn't give us license to just keep on sinning so we can fall deeper and deeper into grace. I mean, that good try, but that's not the case. He, he writes in Romans, he wrote to the church in Rome uh, in, in chapter six, verse one, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may, may abound? By no means. 
How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. We were, our old self is dead. When we surrender to Jesus Christ, we surrender our old self, baptism. Again, we've done this before. Baptism is death burial and resurrection. That means for ourselves, it's death, burial, and resurrection. When we decide to follow Jesus, we fall into grace and we leave our old life behind and we strive to follow him and to love him and to do the things that he asks us to do, which is to love people around us. And we're going to slip up. We're going to make mistakes, but it doesn't mean we have to try to do better and be better and, and do all these things to make ourselves right before God. Jesus made us right before God. And it doesn't mean that we can just continue sinning. Because if Jesus enters your life, your life will be changed. You're going to look different. And then in that freedom that we were talking about before, in freedom, we can just keep, we can keep <clears throat> walking in freedom knowing that we are secure in Christ Jesus and that his grace will abound even when we do slip, slip up. We can take risks because we know that his grace is going to be there to catch us when we fall. That, like I said, this last week I was, um, I was speaking to a bunch of campers at, uh, at, at, a, at a camp down in Big Rapids and it was seven-year-olds up to 13-year-olds. It was a wide range of people. So seven-year-olds who people just stopped peeing just in the, the bed just a few years ago and kids who are super, super hormonal at 13. So I tried to make it applicable to, to that whole wide range. But there are so many other activities that you could do all week long. And, and we took the family. We went down on Sunday. Um, and Monday morning, we, we took a walk. The boys went off somewhere else. And so it was just Leah and I and the two girls, Lila and Elena. And we went, uh, they had this huge rock wall, uh, rock climbing wall outside uh, with the belays and all of that kind of stuff, like the automatic ones. And so you, you put the harness on and you get clicked in and you can rock climb um, up these, these walls. Now, if you were were not harnessed in, you wouldn't want to get up very high because you could fall and, well, die. Uh, and that wouldn't be very good. Insurance companies wouldn't like that very much either. And so uh, you have this harness on and you can rock climb on any of the walls. Now, my two girls did it. Lila is uh, 11 and Elaine is going to be nine. Elena's tiny. She barely was able to fit into it. And she's climbing up the rock wall. She's having a good time. Lila goes up there and Lila's like a spider monkey, right? Like she just climbs everything and she gets to the top first try uh, and, and she rings the bell. And it was incredible that she was able to do that. And then she goes around to the other side. The other side had this spot where like uh, it comes up, it jets out. Like you have to be kind of upside down almost like uh, like you'd, you'd be arched back and then it goes up again and then you can get to the top and there was two sections of it uh right side by side and both of them had that like jet out go up and then come back in but at different spots and so lila tries to do that one she climbs all the way up she gets past the little incline thing part uh that jets out and comes back up she got through that just fine she goes up and she rings the bell and she she's on top of the world at this moment Right, like she took the risk and got all the way up to the top. <clears throat> and then as she was going down, uh, she was close to the other side where that, that also jets out. And as she was just working her way down, you just kind of let go and it, and it falls down. Her loop on her harness got caught on one of the rocks and, and it flipped her basically upside down. And she started freaking out as she would be. I mean, she's you, you, you would be too. You're 20 feet up in the air and all of a sudden you're upside down. But guess what? The harness did its job. And so from the ground, mom and I are like, hey, uh, you're all right. You're all right. Calm down. Don't pull on the belay thing. That's just going to make it worse for you if you eventually just get out. Leave the rope alone. Um, <clears throat> there's a rock right next to you. And she's, she's worried. She's freaking out. She doesn't know what she's going to do. There's a rock right next to you. You're going to have to pull yourself up on that rock. And so she goes and she pulls herself up on the rock and then it lets loose. And then she's able to get down the rest of the way. And she was freaked out. 
But she was never really in any danger because she was harnessed in. You guys, we can take risks for Jesus Christ and we might fall sometimes, but we know, we know without a shadow of the doubt that his grace is gonna catch us every single time we fall. And that's the freedom that we have. That's the freedom that Paul is asking for. A couple days later, Lila was at it again. I think it was the very next day. She, she went up that same side. Now, she didn't get all the way to the top this time, but it didn't stop her from trying again because she knew that she was safe in that harness. And for us, we can take risks and we might fall short sometimes. I guarantee we will. And that's where the grace of Jesus, we fall into that. Let's keep going. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. He says we wait for the hope of righteousness, not righteousness itself. And we have to wait for it. There's absolutely nothing we can do to get this righteousness. There's no, there's no hope for us outside of waiting by His Spirit, through His Spirit, by faith, that we just wait. It means that I can't add anything to do this, to I can't add anything to this in order to make myself more righteous. All we do is wait for the righteousness of God. And that becomes complete. What he's talking about is we wait for the hope of righteousness when Jesus comes back or when we start going back up to him. When we die and we're with him, now the hope of righteousness is fully revealed. Or when Jesus comes back, the hope of righteousness is fully revealed. And it's not determining on anything that we ever do. He's bringing that home again. Verse six, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. It doesn't matter how well you keep the law or don't keep the law. The only thing that matters is faith working through love, which brings us to our next point that faith works through love, not law. God's not interested in the rules that you're going to follow, but the relationship that you have with him and with those around you. He is interested in one rule, love him and love others. Because it's, it, it, it's possible to follow the law without love. It's possible to follow law without love. I can have a checklist of things that I need to do. I can go to church and not love anyone. I can uh, keep the Sabbath and not love anyone. I can make sure that I don't eat any unclean food and not love anyone. It's very easy for me to keep, I can not sleep with my neighbor's wife uh, and and covet their things uh, and still not love. It's very easy to have just a checklist of things to do. And uh, guys, this is why we go to a law-based sense of living. Because to be honest, freedom can be a little bit difficult because it means we have to get into each other's uh, lives and, 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 and 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 it's messy. Law keeps things very, very clean. Love makes things messy. That's just the way it goes. I should write that down. Law makes things clean. It, it, it just is a cleaner way of living. Love is going to get messy. Uh, we're going to have people's filth on us. We're going to uh, get dirty ourselves. We're going to fall into grace many times. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. It's unselfish service to man and to God. Jesus says in uh, John 13, we talked about this a f- several months ago when we were doing our In the Room series. In verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Again, your church attendance does not show that you love. Your prayer life does not show that you love people. It's not going to show that you're a Christian. How many times you go to church isn't going to show that you're a Christian. The only way that people will know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ is by our love. I was listening to a sermon recently, and uh, it was by a guy named Joby Martin, brilliant 
pastor down in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I've learned a bit from him already just in the few months that I've been listening to him. But um, he shared one sermon in particular, and I can't remember what it was, but I do remember the story that he shared about it and <clears throat> or in it. He was talking about when he was a youth pastor, uh, he, he became a youth pastor at this small church, and he was just fresh out of college, like not, <laughs> he's pretty green, okay? And um, he, he was part-time that, and he also uh, worked at a gym. Uh, like a like a gym, like a workout place. And across the street from the workout place was a strip club. And the gym owner uh, provided um, free gym memberships to all of the ladies that worked in the strip club. So they would often come over there. And uh, Joey was just getting started out and he was trying to, um, to, to like he would always have his Bible open uh, at the counter because it wasn't always very busy. And so he would be doing notes, <clears throat> practicing for a sermon, all that kind of stuff. And the girls would be sitting sitting there with smoothies or whatever. And, and so he would <clears throat> strike up a conversation with them and he started asking them, hey, can I practice my sermon on you guys? And they were like, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, because they were just happy that somebody was um, paying attention to them in, in, in a different way, you know? And so he, he starts preaching, uh, giving these messages to them and practicing and they're giving feedback and whatever. And one of the messages, it was about an invite to church. And one of the... <clears throat> excuse me, one of the ladies said, uh, yeah, I'd go to church with you. And he went to a very conservative church and he was like, great, okay, awesome. You're gonna come to church with me. So that Sunday morning, she uh, volunteered to drive. She had a son, she had a child and uh, the child was in the back seat. And so she went to Joby's apartment complex, picked him up uh, in this like convertible car thing. And uh, he's riding with this lady and they pull into the parking lot and he was embarrassed. Because from the parking lot all the way up, he's saying hi to people and they're just getting looks all over the place. Now, Joby's not married at this moment and he's bringing this lady in with a child and, they're, and they know that he's a student ministries pastor and <clears throat> they awkwardly, you know, they, they send the, the, the son uh, off to the kids area and they do that thing and then they go to church and they sit through the service and it, and it was just feeling the heat of stares at them the whole way. And then as they're leaving, they pick up this girl's son. They're heading out the door and some of the elders stop Joby and they say, hey, can we talk to you for a second? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And he's, he's trying to play it cool, but he knows what's about to happen. He knows what's gonna happen next. And so he sends uh, his friend and, and, and the son out to the car. I'll be there in a second. And he goes over and he sits in the office And they started to rebuke him for bringing someone like that into their church. Joby says he was young and didn't know what he was doing. And at the time he said he apologized. And he says, I don't, I don't take many things back, but that's one thing I wish I would have never done is apologize. He goes out and gets in the car and tried to pretend that nothing actually happened. Like, it was, oh, no, it was no big deal. Don't worry about it. But she knew. She knew that she wasn't allowed back at that church. She knew her son wasn't allowed back at that church. Pretty soon after that, uh, she stopped hanging out with them at the gym, at the front counter. She would go in, get her workout in, and then leave. Soon after that, he didn't really see much of her at all. Never got a chance to talk to her again. Never got a chance to share the gospel again. Because the church cared more about the law than love. And faith works through love, not law. Jesus says, the only way that people are going to know that you're my disciples is how you love one another. And how are you doing that with people that don't love you in return, that don't look the same way as you, that don't act the same way as you? How can I show love to somebody that uh, I, I find unlovable? That's when Jesus' love is really going to show, you guys. 
He says that many people would, would uh, or not very many people would even lay down their life for their friends. But Jesus laid down his life for people who were actively opposed to him. And that's what love requires of us. We talked about that a few weeks ago. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. People aren't going to say, wow, look at the way that that guy keeps the Sabbath. He must be a really great Christian. Look at the way that he's, man, did you see how he doesn't work on, on Sunday? Man, oh man, which wasn't really the Sabbath to begin with, but whatever. Man, that, that guy is, is really good. I mean, the guy must be a Christian, right? Wow, did you see how many times that guy went to church? Yeah, must be a really good Christian. It's only by our love. And Paul knows this, and it's why he's pushing so much to the Galatians. It's not about law, it's about love. It's about a relationship. And he keeps going with them, and he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. This isn't from God, this isn't from Jesus. This isn't biblical. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Paul is trying to put an end to this immediately because he knows that there, if this gets out of control, if they start saying circumcision is a thing, then it's going to be the next thing. Then it's keeping the Sabbath, and then it's another thing, and then it's another thing, and then pretty soon, uh, well, we have the church that it is today. That's so focused on looking the right part and doing the right things instead of loving everyone we come into contact with. It's like he, he, Paul is saying that these are weeds that are growing up. And if you don't take care of those things, they're going to be very invasive and they're going to ruin the entire yard. It's like the, if you put a little bit of yeast in the dough, man, it's going to ruin the entire batch. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. That's yeast. So you were running so well. What happened? He says, the person that's troubling you, they're going to be dealt with. I tr I'm trusting in God that that person is going to be dealt with. See, because he's also a pastor. And a pastor means shepherd. And a shepherd protects the flock. And if there's even an, a little bit of an inkling of, of a wolf gathering around, sheep are not very brilliant animals. I like that we are often referred to as sheep because, well, we're not very brilliant either, are we? And, and sheep need to be led. They need to be um, gathered. They need to be shepherded. And it's just like that with us. Like we need to be gathered. We need to be shepherded from outside attacks because we're dumb enough that we'll go off on our own, think, I got this, I can handle this, and we're going to go off on our own and we're going to get attacked by that wolf. Paul is saying, guys, we're going to deal with this and that person is going to be dealt with because I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. I'm going to take care of this. And for Restoration Church, if there is a wolf or anyone that looks like a wolf, we're going to have some conversations to figure this stuff out, to get this out. There's some, some things happening within within the congregation and I just need to address we follow Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. There is no other way. And anyone who's going to speak anything other than Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, we're going to treat you like a wolf. Yeah, that's a threat, I guess. I don't know. Paul is asking them, don't pay attention to those things. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view except Jesus and Jesus alone. That's important for us, church. Verse 11, but if, brothers, 
Oh, sorry. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? And in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. He's saying, guys, if, if I were still preaching circumcision, if I were preaching a gospel of circumcision, then people wouldn't have any issue. But I've told you this before. It's about Jesus and the cross. If I'm only preaching circumcision, then the, the, the case, uh, in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. There's no need for the cross. Get circumcised. Do whatever you got to do. But that's not the case. <laughs> he goes on to say, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. This is strong language, right, from Paul. It, I, I just wish that they would... Man, just emasculate. If you're going to say that you have to be circumcised, then just go all the way and cut the whole thing off. Right? I mean, that's what he's saying. Pagan, and, and he's referencing there's some, like pagan worship. This was often something that would happen in pagan worship. Uh, it often entailed mutilation and emasculation. And so Paul is saying, okay, you want to go that route? You want to go with a false teaching? Then just go all the way. Be a pagan. Follow the rituals of paganism and cut it off. There's only Jesus now. That's the only thing that matters is Jesus Christ. And if you think anything different, then you might as well go the entire way. Paul is very upset because people are bringing, bringing in so many other things to this Jesus equation and it had to stop. And I'm telling us as a church, it has to stop. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus is the exclusively inclusive Savior. He's the exclusively inclusive Savior. I bring this up sometimes. Why would Jesus have to endure the cross if there was a billion ways to get to heaven? If there was a billion ways to have a good relationship with God, then why did Jesus have to endure the cross? God's not a, not a masochist who just wants to see pain inflicted on, on himself and his son. It says that because God loves us so much, that he, it, it's because God's love that he sent his son to die for us, his only son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means uh, paid in full, that the, the debt is paid to turn away the wrath of God. Jesus is our propitiation. And if there was any other way, the cross doesn't make sense. If there was any other, Jesus prays this right before he goes on trial. It, Lord, if there's any other way, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to have a right relationship with God. Jesus is the only way to, to, to have this relationship with God, to be in right standing with God. We have to go through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the way it is now. And I know that that probably upsets somebody who thinks in this day and age that, oh, just whatever you want to believe is fine. God's going to, you, you've got it in the end. God's got you. If you're a good person, you do a lot of good stuff, man, you know what? God's got you. I had a conversation with someone recently who was just like, you know, man, uh, this person, they were just a, a really good person, so I know where they're at. And honestly, I didn't have the heart to tell them it, it's not about how good you are. I don't know why we struggle with this so much. We think that, oh man, God is, it, 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 why does he have to be so exclusive. He's not. He's opening it up to everyone. He's is being as inclusive as he possibly can. Anyone who comes to Jesus and says, I surrender my life to you. Anyone who does that gets in. I, the, the, we, we don't have this issue at Costco. <laughs> okay. I'm going to relate it down to getting groceries at Costco. Okay. Uh, just recently, actually, my wife and I went into Costco because we're members. So you can get like, we have the special pass. You can get in. Uh, and as we were going in, there was one guy who tried to get in without a Costco card. And I don't, I don't know why I, it doesn't make any sense. The, the security person at the door, uh, which isn't really that secure, um, 
she stopped him and was like, hey, uh, do you have your Costco card? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are other people getting in. Uh, and so she turned to, to let these other people in see their cards while this guy's fumbling for his card. And then she turns back around. The guy had just walked off. Like, he's like, oh, I don't you know. He didn't really even have a card. And so I, we were walking through as all of this happened. And I heard her, her remark just be like, well, I, I don't know what he's going to do in there. He can't get anything. He can't do anything. He can't buy anything. He doesn't have the card. You have to have a membership in order to get into Costco. I don't know why it is. It's just the way it is. But you can't use any other membership card to get there. You can't use your Sam's Club membership card to get into Costco. You can't use uh, your, your Meyer M Perks card to get to, to Costco. It doesn't work. The only way you can get into Costco is if you have that little card. The only way we get to heaven, we get a relationship with God, is if we show the card that, yeah, I follow Jesus. If we, if we don't have a problem with that with our groceries, why do we have a problem with that with so many, such a bigger issue? He's exclusive as the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he's inclusive. Because anyone who comes to the Father, anyone who comes to Jesus, gets a relationship. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, there were two criminals, one on either side of him, that deserved to be there. Jesus was the only one of the three that didn't deserve to be there. One was mocking him, the other wasn't. The other one pleaded for his life, and he said, please remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. A last-second prayer, a last-second request to follow. And that God answered, Jesus is inclusive, but he is the only way. And so many of us aren't taking this seriously. We're, our lives aren't showing it. That we belong to Jesus. This is a whole commitment. This is a whole life change. This is not just some little thing, a little club to make yourself feel better on a Sunday morning and then get on with the rest of your life. Go sleep with whoever you want to sleep with, be with whoever you want to be with, and there's no issues whatsoever. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to follow him, and we're going to surrender our lives over to him. The cost was too great for us to waste it. So I don't know where you're at, wherever you are, whoever you are that's listening to this, I don't, I don't know. Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ? Every part of your life, withhold nothing. Anytime we're withholding anything from Jesus, it's like we're putting ourselves back in that cell again. Man, fall into the grace of Jesus Christ. And experience a newness that you've never experienced before. Put to death things of the flesh. And live for Jesus and Jesus alone. It's time to surrender. And we as a church, I hope you guys are ready because it's going to get strong, <laughs> conviction-wise, these next several weeks. And we're going to be so laser focused on Jesus Christ and transforming our lives to look more like him. And if you're ready for that, all you got to do is just say, Jesus, I trust in you. I give you my life. I'm sorry for the sin that I live in. 
and I'm ready to follow. Father, I pray that we would be a church that follows you and nothing else. God, we wouldn't be hindered. We wouldn't be tripped up by any other thing. But God, we would follow you and you alone. And that others would see it and see our love. It's in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you made that prayer, if you've decided to follow Jesus today, if you've made any sort of recommitment or commitment, we want to know about it. You can go to restorationtc.com backslash connect and go all the way down to the bottom. There's a little form you can fill out and just let us know that you've made that decision. We would love to hear from you and we look forward to seeing you uh, next time.